The projector starts, and so begins this episode of Movie Nights and Matinees, the podcast for people who enjoy movies from when we actually had to go to the movies. I'm your host, Bill Groves, and this is episode two, Conjugating Umgawa, in which I will be talking Tarzan with Scott Tracy Griffin, author of Tarzan on Film and Tarzan the Centennial Celebration. So, grab a vine and swing along. This is Tarazan country, while the white men live around here. Well, what do they mean, Bob? Just one of a thousand jungle legends. Something about a wild white man raised by apes. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming along on this journey into the jungle of Tarzan history. I'm extremely pleased to have as my guest a gentleman I first became acquainted with when I was researching a profile of Tarzan TV series back in the 90s for my magazine, Television Chronicles. He was, at the very least, one of the leading authorities on the subject of Tarzan and Edgar Rice Burroughs at that time, and since then, I can't imagine he's anything less than number one on the list. Join me now as I do my best to keep pace with my friend Scott Tracy Griffin. Tracy, welcome to Movie Nights and Matinees. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. You know, it's been a few years since we first met, but you were really helpful in uh, helping me coordinate some of my research, and I remember going to the do they still call it the dum dum yes yes the dum dum convention one of two boroughs conventions every year oh okay so that that explains the other one then because i've seen your post recently on the upcoming event in palm springs that sounded like the the same kind of thing although this one's going to have the 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 walk of fame star there i guess you want to go ahead and share a little bit about that in case anybody wants to grab some last minute tickets uh out there to join yeah, yeah. Well, to backtrack just a moment, there are two uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs conventions in the United States every year. Or they, I think they went to England one year, but but they travel around. It just depends on who wants to host it. So they're in different regions every every year, so different people can attend. First is the Dum Dum, which is a little more formal. It's the longest running. I think the first Dum Dum was, I want to say around 1960, 61. Oh, uh, and for any Tarzan novices, we should probably explain the name. Yes. The Dum Dum harkens back to the very first Tarzan novel, where the apes would gather around an earthen drum and beat it and dance and celebrate. And this uh, looks like something Burroughs read about in the travelogues of the time that the uh, travelers and, and hunters and natives would hear drumming in the forest. So it's a, it's basically a wild celebration, a revel, which uh, maybe we're not that wild at the Dum Dum, but we do have a formal awards banquet where uh, a professional and a fan are both honored. And then the ECOF is a little more laid back, similar type thing. Fans gather from around the country or internationally even. And, and that stands uh, for? Edgar Rice Burroughs' Chain of Friendship. There we go. And that goes back to Burroughs had a pen pal in England named Frank Schoenfeld, who was a lifelong pen pal of Edgar Rice Burroughs from the time Burroughs you know, became famous. This guy was a young lieutenant in the army in World War I, and he started writing Burroughs. And so they corresponded throughout the rest of Burroughs' life and career. So it was named in his honor. He he actually attended the first one in 1984. And it's a little more laid back. The same situation. You have two days in a hotel with huckster rooms with tables full of Burroughs memorabilia for people to buy. The difference with the ECOF is there's no formal banquet. I just didn't want to go through organizing that. We're going to launch this with the unveiling of Edgar Rice Burroughs' star on the Palm Springs Walk of the Stars. I think most people in the world are familiar with the Hollywood Walk of Fame, where right. they have the big granite stars with uh, a little brass or bronze inlay with honoring different celebrities for different fields of endeavor. Same thing with Palm Springs. It's slightly, uh, same concept, I should say, slightly different. They honor philanthropists, military veterans and heroes, presidents, things like that, in addition to actors, authors. So uh, for Linda Burroughs, who's Edgar Rice Burroughs' granddaughter-in-law, we applied for this star a couple of years ago. You know, I didn't know if he would get it. Because there's a, you know, as with Hollywood, there's a, a lot more people wanting these stars than being awarded. It's mm -hmm. their high demand. It's a, it's an honor. Well, there's only so much sidewalk. 
Correct, <laughs> correct. And and they try to do, I think, maybe average about one ceremony a week, October through May in the, the cooler season in Palm Springs. So Ed Grace Bros was awarded the star. We did a Kickstarter. Uh, I'm sorry, a GoFundMe, because, you know, we thought the fans would want to have a part of this honor. And they did. They donated. We reached our goal of $15,000 to install the star, and that pays for the ceremony and security and everything else. So that will be April the 4th at 11 a.m. Tuesday. Mark your calendars. We will Back have your loincloth. Yes, yes. With uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs' family, his heirs, and the fans, uh, we hope to bring a big crowd in. We'll have a convention two days after that. And it's generating a lot of excitement. Our special guest will be actor Tommy Cook, who was in Tarzan and the Leopard Woman. He played the young villain. He was also in a serial, a jungle serial called, a Republic serial called Jungle Girl with Francis Gifford and Tom hmm. Neal. Yes. I mean, he was a child actor. He's been around a long time. He's 92 years old. And he's probably one of the last actors of that era who can talk about what it was like working with Johnny Weissmuller. Really excited that he's going to be our special guest. And I'm going to do a Q&A with Tommy. And we'll post that online later. Anyone can join us. Uh, it's, it's open. It's on the streets of Palm Springs. You can find us on Facebook. Palm Springs will also be putting this out on Twitter and Instagram and everything. A Griceboro Star on the Palm Springs Walk of the Stars is what it's called. So thanks for asking. Oh, sure. Hey, that's why I'm here. And speaking of asking, let's backtrack a little bit. So I think everybody, generally speaking, is familiar with Tarzan to some extent. But in terms of his origins, the term pulp hero, people hear that. And the ones that have much of a sense of what the pulp magazines were, they think, OK, The Shadow, Doc Savage, uh, The Spider, you know, G8 you know, that kind of thing. But a lot of people don't realize Tarzan was actually a pulp hero. Well, before any of those guys. So you want to talk a little bit about his, uh, his origins in that regard? Sure. Well, it all goes back to Edgar Rice Burroughs, the author. Personally, I think Burroughs was a creative genius. And I think a lot of people share that view. I, I you know, I'm not alone in that estimation. He was uh, a guy who was born in 1875 in Chicago grew up to upper middle class parents, moved around a lot, traveled the country. He was a cowboy and a gold miner and uh, a cop and had a lot of professions and never seemed to make it work. So he decided to try his hand at writing. He was flipping through the pulp magazines. His company, they were selling pencil sharpeners. They were advertising the pulps. So he starts flipping through and, and reading some of the stories and said, you know what, I think I can outdo these guys. And, you know, people think of Burroughs as a raw novice. He was 36 years old when his first story was printed. But, you know, he had been telling stories all his life from childhood. He wrote poetry. He told tall tales. He entertained his children with bedtime stories. So he was a natural storyteller. And his first story became the book A Princess of Mars. He sent half of it to the editor at The All Story, which was one of the, the better pulp magazines in the 1911-1912 era. They liked it. They printed it. They asked for something else. He sent them what became an outlaw of torn, and they rejected it. So successful. I don't think I don't think I realized that John Carter predated Tarzan. Yes, that was his first thing. So so he success with the first one failed with the second. So he was Tarzan was kind of a I think for Burroughs, it was he was kind of putting it all on the line. Am I going to be able to make this writing thing work? He was only batting 500. And I think he really poured his heart and soul into it. This was Burroughs proving not just to the world, but to himself what he could do. And I think Tarzan, you know, I like all of his readings. I read everything that's been published by him numerous times. But I think Tarzan of the Apes was his high point. I do think that he really, that's really his best work. If people ask what should you read, definitely Tarzan of the Apes, written in 1912. It was sent to the pulps. You know, interesting, the pulps like to serialize these stories. I was going to ask. I, I know it was published in uh, All Story, but I, w I was wondering if it was serialized or if it was uh, as... Well, for instance, Shadow and Doc Savage, if it was the complete novel all at once. Well, it was not serialized. And, and you know, they, they all story. And that, that was the name at the time. It changed names, you know, as time went on. They, they combined it with other magazines and so forth. But the all story, they had had broken A Princess of Mars up into five installments. But they got Tarzan and the editor, I believe, read it in one sitting. And, you know, this is over 100,000 words. This is like 104,000 words, I think. So it's not a short story or a short right. novel. Or novel. It's a full length novel. And he read it and he loved it. And he sent it around to the editorial staff. They loved it. So they said, we're going to print this thing complete in one issue. And it was hmm. a cover story. 
Yeah. So yeah. this was quite a boon for Burroughs, you know, and this was what really took off. It was such a success. The magazine sold out. The editor came back and said, I want a sequel to Tarzan and a sequel to Princess of Mars. So this was what really set Burroughs on his his career path at the age of 36. Now, see, what, now what year did he debut in All Story? That was 1912. 1912. And it was, what, like the following week or something that the first movie was made? <laughs> oh, general. No, Elmo was, was, was 1918. 1918. Okay. Take you through a little more of the history. 20, uh, 1912, the book, the magazine is a huge hit. Right. Newspapers started serializing and they got the rights from the Pulp magazine. Burroughs said, wait, wait, wait. You know, I expected you to have first serial rights only. And now you're selling this to other people. And they were kicking him back maybe $20 off a two or $300 sale. And he was saying, no, 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 I didn't give you permission to do this. Burroughs was really a, um, he was a pioneer in author's rights, a pioneer in IP. So he trademarked Tarzan in 1913, checked him, and he said, from now on, you send me the offers. And, and at one you know, at one point, he stopped letting the magazine serialize at all. He said, I'll serialize. He hired a syndicate. So, so Tarzan was serialized, and that's one reason it blew up so big. And then so he had the novel in 1914. Uh, it came out in book form, and it was rejected despite its success by a lot of publishers until A.C. McClurg in Chicago was a hometown publisher. Burroughs was from Chicago. He lived there in Chicago. They published the novel. So once Burroughs got this hard copy in hand, you know, it was more prestigious than a magazine. Oh, yeah. It's, you know, delicate and falling apart. The Probably had a dust jacket. Nice. Even. Right, right. That's when he sent the, the novel to a, an agent in New York, and he started trying to shop this thing around. And, you know, the, the process of getting this movie made that, you know, we go from 1914 to 19. To 1918. It was a four year process. And he sent it to William Selig, who was one of the top jungle film producers at the time in Chicago, but he had a menagerie and he had jungle backdrops. He was shooting jungle films there in Chicago and a little in Florida and LA too. Uh, he, he sort of branched out to those places. But uh, Selig actually shot The Lad and the Lion, which was another Burroughs story. It was sort of a Tarzan with lions, uh, a young European. Heir of noble blood is, is stranded among lions and friends of the lions. So the Lad and the Lion was the, actually the first Burroughs film in 1917. They finally uh, put Tarzan together and it was, you know, as big a hit as the pulp magazine and had been. You know, it, there were 5,000 people turned away from the first showing in New York City. Wow. That was uh, January 27th, 1918. So we just passed the 105th anniversary mm -hmm. of that debut. Yeah, because I mean, a lot of people that think in terms of Tarzan movies, they immediately go to the Johnny Weissmuller uh, series, since he was the most prolific. I mean, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but they don't realize just how many Tarzans preceded him in the silent era. Yeah, and, I believe Johnny was number seven or eight. Yeah, I've been trying to do my homework here and, and get a little bit caught up because there were several of the silence. Well, not just silence, but the the more obscure ones that I hadn't actually seen. I saw Tarzan and the Golden Lion. That was, um, you know, James Pierce. And then I've been trying to get through, I, I swear, I've been trying to get through Son of Tarzan. But the <laughs> the problem is the quality, and maybe there's a better print of it somewhere, but the one that I've seen and, and is that's readily available, you know, I don't know how many generations it's been through. It's the wrong projection speed. It's a lot. It's hard to follow the action, quite frankly, in a lot of it. So I just I have not made it through that whole thing yet. But, yeah, I enjoyed Tarzan and the Golden Lion reasonably well. And one thing that I kind of got a kick out of there was that one of the secondary characters is played by Harold Goodwin, who I know mostly from the films he did with Buster Keaton as his nemesis in uh, The Cameraman and College and some right. other stuff later on. So seeing him there was was kind of fun. But I finally saw Tarzan's Revenge, you know, Glenn Morris. And I was hesitant to watch that one. I had seen clips from it before. And they they didn't show him off to good advantage in the clips. I mean, because he's, he's got this kind of bright-eyed face, or, you know, big eyes and... He looked like Harpo of the jungle, quite frankly, to me. But <laughs> yeah, but I actually thought he did a, a decent job in that. And I think he could have been in some better films. It's the script. They gave him virtually nothing to say. Right. Right. I mean, very similar with Tarzan, the speechless, uh, fearless Buster Crab. I mean, he says almost nothing until really the end of the film. 
uh, which is a, a topic I kind of wanted to get with you too. Uh, of course, we've we've largely jumped through the silent era, but there's so much still to get to. But one of the things I've noticed in the Tarzan films is they don't use very much in terms of the animal names that Burroughs used. I mean, you know, Numa the lion, Tontor the elephant, uh, Murray the crocodile. No, I actually, I think, I think he may have been edited out. But that was the irony of, of the Tarzan the Fearless at the end is one of the few instances of that where the female lead is trying to teach Tarzan English. And, you know, she's pointing to the elephant. Tantor. No, Tarzan. Not Tantor. I've got to teach you English. It's an elephant. Tantor. And I thought, okay, that, that, that may be the only time I've ever heard him referred to as Tantor in any Tarzan film that I've seen. Yeah, um, well, there were eight silents, and uh, or some of them serials, silent right. features and serials, and they were all successful successful enough to keep generating more. Yeah. Fairly successful. You're right. They didn't really tap into Burroughs' whole mythology. And I think one reason was, and you know, we can get into this a little deeper, when MGM signed Weissmuller up and they did Tarzan the Ape Man, that was due to the success of Trader Horn. And they had sent a an expedition with Woody Van Dyke and his cameraman and uh, you know a skeleton crew to Africa to film on location. And they had the three actors, you know, filming there: Edwina Booth and Duncan Ronaldo and Harry Carey Sr. And they filmed. They crisscrossed East Africa back and forth. I think they went fourteen thousand miles. They claimed filming footage, and they got back. And the footage it was just a mess. There was no sound. Sound had come in during the process, so they sent sound equipment. Development on the film wasn't ideal because they were developing this film with water from whatever water hole they were at. And uh, it just was not, you know, it, it, the water was different. But they they salvaged the movie, two million feet of film, and it was a huge hit. And it was an Academy Award nominated film. So they had all this two million foot of African location footage, you know, varying quality. And yeah. Irving Thalbrick said, let's do another movie. Let's another jungle movie. Let's do Tarzan. So they negotiated with Burroughs, they got the right, and that's what became Tarzan the Ape Man with Weissmuller. And I think one reason that it is so iconic is they poured a lot of money and resources into that. It was an, you know, equivalent to an A-list picture back then. And yeah. uh, I think it shows on camera at least the first two MGM Weissmullers. Yeah, and the thing that really stands out for me uh, in that first one especially is that, you know, the later films... I guess you could say Tarzan was more domesticated. I mean, but in that in that first one that Weissmuller did, I mean, you see the savage in that one, and that really harkens back to Burroughs' concept of the character more so than than uh, so many of the others. Yeah, and you know, Tarzan and his mate they they really uh, upped the quotient on that one because in the interim, you know, Tarzan the Ape Man in nineteen thirty two, Tarzan and his mate nineteen thirty four, King Kong came out. Mm -hmm. and this set a new bar for jungle films. So they threw everything they had into Tarzan his mate. They bought a rhinoceros. They shipped this rhinoceros to Southern California to show Tarzan battling the rhino, jumping on its back with a knife and the rhino charging. And then they could recycle all that footage throughout the other movies, you know, built a mechanical crocodile, which Tarzan battled. They had this huge grand finale with the natives called the Lion Men, who blow these big horns and they bring mobs of lion in to kill the safari. Then of course, Tarzan has to call in his mob of apes and elephants to come mm -hmm. kill the lions and the natives. And so it's just a huge, uh, epic battle. And, uh, you know, the turning point, you mentioned that they, they sort of, it went the other way for children was the next film, Tarzan escapes, which started out as a movie called the capture of Tarzan, which was, you know, still violent and, and, um, sexually suggestive and all of these things that the prior had been, you know, in the pre-code era, but they tested the movie with, uh, they had these giant devil bats that were left over from, I believe, Mark of Dracula, one of their other, other films. And they had glowing red eyes and they would swoop down on little wires, these big bats and, and carry off the natives and stuff, screaming natives. And, mm -hmm. and they showed this and the young people in the audience just freaked out. It was scary. So they, stopped and took a step back and sort of retrenched that's when the in my opinion the the films it was sort of a turning point they became much more family friendly they developed this treehouse with all the 
you know, the ostrich's eggs for omelets and, and, you know, some of it that today looks a bit silly. That's when MGM really became sort of family friendly and turned a curve and became, you know, regarded today more as child's fare. Yeah, that reminds me of one of the things that kind of stood out that I found interesting in your book, which we should probably start talking about now. I mean, you've got a couple of books. You did Tarzan, the Centennial Celebration a few years back, but then more recently, Tarzan on Film, which is it's what would commonly be called a coffee table book because it's that big. Yes. But, <laughs> but you know something? It's it's terrific. I mean, it's not one of those that you think of where, okay, yeah, it's, it's big. It's going to be on the coffee table. You just flip through it and you just look at the pictures and go, okay, that's nice. That's nice. You know, so what, because you've got a lot of information in there. Nevertheless, you'll have these beautiful full color pages with the poster art from the films. And then you've got a description, you know, a little, uh, the format being a synopsis of the plot followed by the, the notes and information about the making of the movie. And then alternately, you've got comparable information and pictures, lots of pictures of the various stars, co-stars, supporting players, that kind of thing that were in them. And and one of the ones that I remember from it was the one where you talk about Tarzan Escapes and how the the cast members, the stars helped build the treehouse. Yes, yes. And, you know, this was, you know, they said it was to help get Johnny and Maureen in the mood, I guess, a little bit of uh, pre-method acting. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, of course, it was probably more for publicity for anything, but they had to weave mats and and build. And, and, you know, this was a big folly who this tree. Did they have to join the union to do that? That's a good question. I don't know if the uh, if IATSE, if it existed, then was upset about this. or uh, But I suspect it was more of a publicity ploy than anything. Mm. But uh, another thing, too, just right off the bat, uh, you've got uh, one of the more recent Tarzans, Casper Van Dien, who did the foreword for your book. And even just within the foreword, I mean, he's relating some fascinating anecdotes of his experiences uh, in the loincloth. You know, these films, one reason I find them so fascinating is that it combines some of the things that some of the most challenging filmmaking that you can have. And and as Casper said, I'm sure Casper has a lot more stories he could tell, as could every Tarzan. You know, you interviewed, a, did a very extensive interview with Ron Ely that I resourced in my book. It was one of my resources there in, in Television Chronicles. Yeah, I saw you gave me a shout out. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It, it was excellent material. And, and I might say one of the only places you can find that type of material, you know, not just with Ron, but with Wolf Larson and, um, you know, Manuel Padilla and other actors. Yeah, I tried to get yeah, Mike Henry, to and I think it was you who told me that he, at that time he he wouldn't talk about Tarzan. So I was surprised recently to learn that, in fact, he had uh, a few years ago. Well, I mean, you know, he, he passed away a couple of years ago, I guess. But prior to that, he had given a, a pretty extensive interview to Film Facts, which I didn't yes. know. And I've I've since been able to read half of it. <laughs> it was two issues. I've only been able to find the the part that was in one issue. Yeah, and we tried to get in touch with Mike Henry for another book I did. We tried everything you might imagine, appealing to his wife, appealing to family, friends, um, you know, and he just uh, would not buy. But yeah, what what I started to say was, you know, the inner, these Tarzan movies, because first of all, you have tremendous stunts and physicality that are required of the actors. You have animals, live animals in mm-hmm. a lot of these that are totally unpredictable and, and can be very dangerous. And you have inclement weather. You know, if you're filming on a location, that has been a factor in the challenges that some of these Tarzan films producers have faced. What's fascinating is it's not just on a sound stage, you know, delivering lines. Yeah. You're out yeah. in the elements and you're doing stunts and you're you're having to interact with animals, wild animals whom you may not have met before mm-hmm. or new wild animals. You know, certainly they're they're captive, but a lot of them weren't tame or or and were only had minimal training. Yeah. So uh, certainly with Ron, you know, and he he talks about that in your interview and and in other things he's done about how they had, you know, just minimal training for some of these animals he had to wrestle. Well, and he related a story, too, about an elephant that um, I don't want to say went berserk. That might be a little unfair to what was going on. But anyway, an elephant got very upset and ended up uh, killing some people. Yes, yes. And, you know, these uh, sort of incidents, even though that happened down, I believe it was in Mexico. I know he filmed in Mexico and Brazil. 
you know, and they didn't have the sort of animal welfare presence on sets down there at that time that, mm-hmm. that we have today and that we have had in America for, for many years. And these kind of unexpected, unforeseen um, tragedies happened. Yeah. You know, there were actors who were certainly mauled on the Tarzan films by lions on, on several mm-hmm. times on the silence and others. Um, it's it's tough. You know, it's interesting. I read little bits and pieces in the press, but that was largely kept out of the press. You know, you you paid the right people. You greased the right palms. MGM certainly had their own police force and their own fixers who would keep any kind of harmful information out of the press. Yeah. And as far as the your your book goes, how would you say that your approach to the book Tarzan on film how that how does that differ from the previous books that were done on the Tarzan movies? Well, that's uh, that's interesting. You know, if I can d- digress just a moment, you know, I discovered Edgar Rice Burroughs when I was nine, and I started reading and rereading reading the novels. And I was fourteen when I discovered Gabe Esso's book Tarzan of the movies. I walked into a book fair that, you know, of used books, and there it was, you know, on Lee Mall in Columbus, Mississippi, this tiny uh, little town. And and I found Gabe Esso's book. And I had not seen much of Tarzan on screen at that point. I had seen bits and snippets of of Tarzan's and maybe some movies when I was very small. But my real introduction to these actors was Gabe's text. Mm. And I remember reading and I read that just as avidly as I read Edgar Rice Burroughs. You know, because this sort of quantified what it takes to be Tarzan, which is ideally, you know, Olympic medals. You know, you need an Olympic caliber athlete in those days to be credible on screen, certainly. And so Gabe did a wonderful job. Gabe's text is kind of narrative and chronological. He takes you through film by film, but it's a, a straight narrative from one chapter to the next. And then that brings you to Dave Fury. I believe he came out in 1994 with Kings of the Jungle. Dave was a little more structured than Gabe. He went mm-hmm. film by film. He had a section for a chapter for each film. He did a long, longer synopsis than what I did. And then he did some behind the scenes stuff and uh, minimal pictures because it was black and white and it was more of a textbook. As Gabe had a lot of pictures, Gabe's was sort of, uh, I would say, if not a coffee table book, at least a hybrid between a, a regular book and coffee table book because it had a lot of black and white photos yeah. and uh, text. So actually, I faced this challenge first with Tarzan, the centennial celebration, because about 60 percent of that book is devoted to the novels. That's 320 pages of of the book is. So about 60 percent was the novels. And then I do a big chunk on the comic books and the films. And that was my dilemma is how can I present this material different from Gabe and Dave, who did such a great job with it? And so what I came up is, well, I'll do it by era. Because to me, watching them, the, the films are sort of defined not just chronologically, but by the producers. Hmm. You know, so you have the silent films, which I lumped together. And then you have the MGM era, six films with Johnny Weissmuller. You have yeah. the Saul Lesser era. He wound up shooting 16 films, I believe it was, and a TV pilot. And the Cy Weintraub era, the next seven films. And then I sort of lumped the rest of them into contemporary films, modern films, because they really, there wasn't a, a defining producer or anything with the the modern films. They've all been individual productions. So that was the challenge. That's the way I handled that challenge with Centennial Celebration. And the way Tarzan on Film came about, I pitched Titan, my publisher, to handle the the rest of the Burroughs material to give it the same treatment as Tarzan Centennial Celebration. In, In other words, a book that was full of John Carter, Parson of Venus, Pellucidar, all these other fantastic fictional series and, and standalone novels. He wrote Westerns and historical adventure. I said, well, you know, I, I did a formal proposal. Even though I was on good terms with him and had done one book with him and I presented this proposal. And, you know, they flipped through it and said, well, the John Carter movie didn't do too well. How about mm-hmm. Tarzan on film? You know, there hasn't been a great Tarzan on film book in a few years at that point. The marketplace was open. So I said, yes. And I went home. I wrote the proposal up as soon as I got home and I sent it off. It was on his desk. When he got back to London and, um, you know, we agreed and it took a couple of years. We, we synced the book up. That was 2014. They synced the book up to come out with the Alexander Skarsgård movie, The Legend of Tarzan. So with that, uh, I, I went back to sort of a similar model to Dave Fury because we were doing really sort of an, a comprehensive, thorough investigation of Tarzan with a lot of color photos. And that was one thing that was the sort of the boost that my book had that the others, our books hadn't have was that it was full of color stills and photos. But the material is similar. I I shortened the synopsis, just gave a very brief synopsis with either the novel synopses or the 
film synopses, they didn't want me to spoil it for new people. So that was sort of my charge was don't give away the ending if you can help it. And then I did behind the scenes. And, and you know, then the, the challenge becomes, how do I find stuff that Dave and Gabe have not reported on? And what I found was newspaper archives, LA Times. They are now online. They're digital. They're searchable. Uh, the LA Sentinel, which was the large black newspaper of the segregation era, one of them. And they talk about, you know, a lot of the extras and their experience on the movies, the men who played the natives and the women. And so that was sort of gave me a chance. I tried to, to sort of sprinkle nuggets throughout that had never been published before in that sort of format. And I think I was successful to to give it a little bit of a new spin and uh, give uh, material a new perspective. Tremendous respect for Gabe and Dave. You know, I, I have four or five books that are my dog-eared references, and their two film books are among those four or five book for Burroughs. Yeah, I still need to get myself a copy of uh, Gabe Esso's book. I do have the David Fury book, which kind of became my yearbook of the the Tarzan actors that I interviewed. Uh, well, in a couple of cases, I just you know got their autographs at a collector shows, but otherwise, I, I I've got about seven Tarzan autographs uh, in there. I wanted to jump back and ask. So, what was the first Tarzan movie that you remember seeing? And it may not be the same answer, but the first one that you remember seeing in a theater. Okay. There were two, I remember, you know, I mentioned that there were some images that, that I kept from smallest childhood. Mm -hmm. I was three or four. And those images are Tarzan, the ape man with Denny Miller. Ah. When the uh, safari party are trapped, they're down in a fiery pit with an idol. The, the natives have sacrificed them to their idol and they're down in the pit with this idol and Tarzan has to rescue them. I remember that very clearly, mm. but it's interesting. You know how you're, memory becomes garbled sure. i actually in childhood thought that was a scene from king solomon's mines the 1950 version with stuart granger and i was looking for this you know in the pre vhs before vhs has become so became so widely available in the mid 80s i thought it was that movie and i wanted to see that movie but when i saw denny's movie it came back to me and you know i saw king solomon's mines and didn't quite see the scene i was re remembering and what's interesting is of course they used the same wardrobe and a lot of stock footage from that King Solomon's Mine in Denny's movie. So that Denny Miller movie was the one of the first. And the Jock Mahoney Tarzan's Three Challenges, where he's battling Woody Strode on nets over the oil pot. Hmm. I remember that terrified me as a kid, the idea that they might fall into these boiling pots of oil. So those were the first two that really stuck with me. I saw bits and pieces of the Ron Ely series. I grew up in rural Mississippi, and we only had three television channels. We had... Uh, NBC, CBS, and PBS. We didn't get cable. We didn't have movie channels. So I was sort of at the mercy of network television. And so I didn't see a lot of Tarzan movies growing up. My first theatrical movie was actually Greystoke. Huh. I was a freshman in college, and that was the first time. Uh, Bo Derek, that movie came out. I was in high school, and my mother forbid me from going. Of Can't course, I probably would have have sneaked in if I could, but it, it, you know, honestly, it came and went so quickly. I, I couldn't formulate a plan to sneak in before uh, it was gone from the theaters. So Greystoke was my first. And, you know, I, I went by myself. I just wanted to be immersed. I didn't want mm -hmm. someone to be talking to me. I didn't want to be on a date. I just wanted to sit there and be immersed in this world. Yeah, you know, I, I really was. Uh, I loved the, the jungle sequence. And of course, when they go to England, it, it the jungle sequence is very close to Edgar Rice Burroughs. Robert Town, the screenwriter, scripted that, you know, almost chapter by chapter from Tarzan of the Apes. But when they leave for England, of course, that's a totally original creation. That was Hugh Hudson and, and uh, Michael Austin, his writer. That was their storyline. And it doesn't, you know, have much reflection on Edgar Rice Burroughs. Which actor slash performance do you think most accurately embodies the character as written by Edgar Rice Burroughs? Well, that's challenging because I don't think any of them fully achieved it. And I don't think that's necessarily the fault of the actors. You know, they can only do what's written on the page. So yeah. it's screenplay, it's the director's vision, it's the uh, producers, what they think is going to be marketable. We see, I, I like the more articulate Tarsons. I mm -hmm. like Ricks, I like Ron Ely, I like Casper, Van Dien, but you know, Alexander Skarsgård, I like them because Tarzan is literate and articulate, and I, I really don't care for the monosyllabic, doesn't speak English approach, you know, coming from a um, 
perspective in the novels where, where Tarzan, you know, he never sort of went through a pidgin English phase. He spoke the ape language and he was taught human language and, and appears on the scene in, in America, you know, a few weeks later speaking the king's English. Yeah, we were talking about Greystoke. And I think for me, I would have to say, even though that's not one of my favorite Tarzan films, I think that one maybe comes closest, at least for me, in terms of the character and the portrayal of the character. Because I'm like you, I do like the more articulate Tarzans, but it seems like every time they did that, they kind of severed the the animal instinct from him, the, uh, the savage mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. Whereas my memory of the Burroughs novels that I read, it's like, okay, yeah, Tarzan, he can, he can walk you know, with the, the civilized people and everything, but man, you get him riled <laughs> and he's, uh, you're in trouble. And yeah, the savagery and ferality, I think, you know, you, we saw glimpses of that with Weissmuller, as you said, Lambert, there were other, you know, Michael Henry certainly looked apart, you know, Mike Henry, mm -hmm. he um, looks like he came out of a Burroughs novel. Um, so there are different elements and perspectives. I have respect for the athleticism and the stunt work of people like Jock Mahoney. Yeah. So it's kind of like you have you know, every Tarzan offers something different, and, and uh, I like them all, but I don't think we've seen that one that really is firing on all cylinders for Edgar Rice Burroughs' Tarzan. Yeah, yeah, I would tend to agree. Now, maybe a tricky question, but overall of the entire Tarzan canon, and you might want to factor in different eras, you know, the silent era, Weissmuller, et cetera. Which ones would you consider essential viewing for someone who really wants to get a good comprehensive experience of Tarzan on film over the years? Well, the list has grown, you know, in my time span. So that's a good thing. Certainly, I would start with Tarzan the Ape Man and Tarzan and his mate with Johnny Weissmuller, both pre-code, both, as we've noted, you know, had an element, an era, element of savagery, mm -hmm. both had very good budgets, both had the best craftsmen in Hollywood working on them at the time. So they're very, uh, they have high production values. So the first two Weissmullers, and I would jump forward to 1959, 1960 for Gordon Scott, Tarzan's greatest adventure. The screen comes alive with all the pulsating thrills and exciting characters created by fiction's foremost author of African adventure, Edgar Rice Burroughs. And Tarzan the Magnificent. A lot of people prefer Magnificent because it has Jock Mahoney in it as one of the villains. Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm among them. Yeah, I actually pref prefer Greatest Adventure because I like Sarah Shane, who was the leading lady in that one. And, uh, you know, same, similar. They both had, they both basically were the same movie, you know. Cy, Cy Weintraub, you know, if if you have picked a winner, just stick with a winner. Tarzan hunts a band of outlaws in Africa. You know, Westerns, they were Westerns set in Africa of, of the lone man who's outnumbered and outgunned, and he has to bring these guys to justice. But I like Sarah Shane. I like the Sean Connery. I, I you know, I just felt like Tarzan's greatest adventure has a little more color to it than Magnificent. But they're both both good films if you want to see it. And he yeah. starts getting a little more articulate. And then I would jump forward to, as you said, Greystoke. Mm -hmm. The jungle sequence of Greystoke is one of my favorite films overall of all films. And Disney, I think, for children, it's a good introduction to the character. They take liberties with the origin story. But, you know, it's certainly it, it has a lot of elements from Burroughs. And uh, then the Alexander Skarsgård would be my final pick. So that's, you know, seven or eight movies. So that's a, a lot of required viewing. Right. Is there one that you think is maybe the most underappreciated of uh, the lot? Underappreciated. That's probably Casper's movie, Tarzan and the Lost City, 1998. Hmm. Yeah, that makes um, sense. A new Tarzan. For a new generation. And a new adventure. To save the cradle of civilization. Didn't have a big budget, only about 20 million. And this started as a sequel to Greystoke, Greystoke 2. You know, I think a lot of, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of heartened by this. I think a lot of Burroughs fans and Tarzan fans really do agree with me that it's underappreciated. The Casper did a great job. You know, there were limitations to, one, first of all, the budget. There's very little bit of apes in there. The script actually had the apes in it. And they the, the ape suits were so bad, they just cut that footage out entirely. And the original mm -hmm. script was much more violent and savage than what we saw on the screen. I did uh, a workup of this this uh, film for Center Fantastic magazine. So I got to do pretty extensive interviews with Bayard Johnson, who was the writer. Uh, Stan Cantor, who was the producer, executive producer, came over from Greystoke. He was the guy who who got Greystoke started with, with Robert Town, friends with Robert Town. 
and uh, Casper. So I, I really did sort of a deep dive on this film. I got the original script and I sat and I watched the movie reading the script and I did sort of a breakdown of what was left out and what went wrong. And, and I'd love to write that up as an article for the movie magazine someday, because that, you know, even with what they did put on the screen, I think they did a good job and I think it's, it's underappreciated. Yeah. It's been a while since I've seen it, but I do remember being surprised and enjoying it. Um, I need to revisit it at some point. One thing, this is really out of left field, but, a couple of years ago or so, I, I started collecting Viewmaster reels. I just got it in my head. Oh, it might be fun to go back to those in some of the places that I visited uh, with my wife over the years and get reels of those. And as I was kind of exploring the the new hobby, I discovered that there were some Tarzan Viewmaster reels. Are you familiar with these? Have you seen these? I have those. I actually found those in childhood. Mm, they were really released at some point. And I think I was a little older. Of course, when I was a really small child, I, I loved the Viewmaster stuff and had a lot of them. And then I sort of outgrew it. And that's when I found Tarzan and sort of reignited my passion. We even had the projector. You could drop the reels into a little projector and right. throw the images onto the wall. Um, uh, and I remember just studying, of course, I believe it was at an Italian guy who did the sculptures. They're little clay sculptures. Oh, right. That one actually slipped my mind. Yes, Viewmaster created a lot of story packets, uh, fairy tales, cartoon characters, and works of literature. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea is one that comes to mind, uh, using those finely crafted maquettes to be able to have the 3D effect. And Tarzan of the Apes, uh, the Tarzan of the Apes set was one of those. The reels I was thinking of, though, were ones tied into the movies. There was one reel featuring Lex Barker and three reels with Gordon Scott. The Gordon Scott reels were released individually, but then later packaged as a set, also titled Tarzan of the Apes. Nothing confusing about that. And although there's not an easy way to tell what Lex Barker movie was being filmed when his reel was created, the copyright dates make it pretty evident that the Gordon Scott images were shot in conjunction with his first Tarzan movie, Tarzan's Hidden Jungle. Right. I have not run across those except on, you know, collector's tables or whatever, where they're pretty pricey. One thing that, that's cool about them is that uh, at least at least one of the Gordon Scott ones, they they have some of the the best just color and composition of stuff like that that I've seen. But see, the thing is, they're not shots from the films. They obviously would have been taken on the set of films being created. But um, the Gordon Scott ones, for instance, bear no relationship to anything that was in the movie. Uh, that he was making at the time these these reels were created. So they obviously mm-hmm. showed up. Viewmaster had a crew show up and say, oh, let's get some shots here. And then they kind of came up with their own little narrative of what's happening in them as right. a plot line for uh, seven images. But mm-hmm. uh, they're, yeah, they're pretty cool. I suspect that if you've seen them at high prices at dealers tables, it's mainly due to them being kind of off the beaten path of the usual Tarzan collectibles. So in the context of a convention, they're probably seen as something exotic. And so dealers price them higher than they would if it was, I don't want to say, a gathering of Viewmaster collectors. You should be able to find them pretty easily on eBay at reasonable prices. A question for you. Um, You know, Gordon talks about how when he was on set, they would come to him and they would take him out to a park and they would just shoot a bunch of photos with him. And these were photos that were used on the comic books, the Dell comics. And a lot of them were used overseas. There are overseas comics that have Gordon Scott covers that were never, the photos were never published or released in the United States. Do you know, were the Viewmasters a separate thing entirely? I guess if they were on the film set and they had the props and everything, they would have been. Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, you know, they could have been done at the same time. There could have been some coordination to that effect, but I would say they probably didn't have to because this Viewmaster, you know, was kind of a big deal at the time of doing this sort of stuff. I did mm-hmm. it on, on a number of TV series and, and so forth. So I, I'm sure they would have made probably made their own appointment to, you know, come out and uh, do something. And so there may have been some preparation on the production and, okay, well, with Viewmaster people are coming, let's, uh, let's set up some scenes and, you know, maybe they even came up with the narrative that went on, on the image descriptions. But one of them, it was funny because one of them, before I had seen the reel, it's called Tarzan finds a son. And oh, really? With, yeah. With and, 
yeah, when I when I saw that, I'm thinking, okay, did they? Now I know that Viewmaster debuted in 1939. Did they go back and get some some frames from you know the Weissmuller film and you know mess around with them and create some 3D effect or whatever? But no, it was uh, just they shot some took some shots with Gordon Scott and uh, and a kid and and whatnot. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, you know, like I said, I've seen these on collector's table, but I've never popped one into a Viewmaster and, and and looked at it. I may have seen some images online, so that's I'll, I'll have to look for those if you say they're out there and they're affordable. Oh, and one thing, I guess, considering the the name of the episode, we need to talk about the subject of Amgawa. <laughs> you know, Amgawa is one of those great uh, words. You know, I think it's a cultural touchstone with Tarzan, just like you know the knife, the loincloth, and the treehouse. It's something, and the yell certainly. Mm-hmm. It's something that a, a lot of people know, a lot of lay people who don't necessarily watch the movies religiously or read have read the books, but they associate it. And, you know, as best I can tell, it was a word that was, you know, a leftover Swahili word from Trader Horn. You know, you mentioned earlier about how Tarzan did not use the ape language. He used Swahili words. You know, it was Timbo the elephant, which comes from uh, the African languages. And so some of the animal names and stuff he used were from Africa, from the Trader Horn expedition. Of course, it was the same, mostly the same film crew and um, writers overlapped. Cyril Hume, you know, was one of the writer on some of the Tarzan movies. So uh, it's it's interesting <laughs> and it's funny. People just like they yell. They want to bring that up. I thought I remembered it from David Fury's book, but I went back and looked. And if if he made the comment, I. I haven't found it yet, but I thought he was the one who referred to it as kind of like the Swiss army knife of, uh, of African words that in terms of being able to mean most anything. Yeah. It was sort of an all purpose word. It seemed to mean stop, go, you know, lift me up or, uh, take boy and run from danger. It, you know, when he, when he would say it to the elephants or the animals, it, it did seem to be sort of an all purpose. And maybe that was just the writers having fun. Maybe it stuck in the public's consciousness, you know, the first time they used it and they just tried to work it in wherever they could. Well, I did some extensive research and and I, I believe I've uncovered it. It turns out that Umgawa translates as I am Groot. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Probably the most unfair question of all. What what would you consider your personal favorite uh, Tarzan movie? You know, I don't have a single favorite because, uh, you know, as I noted, there are strong points and weak points in every film. Probably the ones that I listed earlier as the the better films. I will say that my favorite representation of Tarzan in this media would be the TV show Tarzan Lord of the Jungle. Oh, right. It yeah, you talked about seven. that in, uh, I think it was the Notable Nerds uh, podcast. Yeah, because that was Tarzan. You know, he had that strong, noble appearance. And a lot of the episodes were drawn from the novels and and sort of the, the correct milieu for Tarzan. He speaks, you know, regular English, but he's got the look and the savagery as a knife. He has the monkey Nakima. Of course, that was a divergence for the film, starting with Weissmuller, was that there was a chimpanzee named Cheetah. Yeah. And again, this was a big uh, sort of a sop to the audience and to children, you know, that Cheetah's Humorous antics were the comedy of the Tarzan films, mm-hmm. but there were no cheetahs and no no chimpanzees in the Tarzan books. Tarzan had a small monkey companion who would be the one who would go get the key when Tarzan was thrown in a dungeon or something. So mm-hmm. I really like Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle. And I think Disney did a good job with the legend of Tarzan. You know, while we're on that same topic, they went back to Burroughs novels and they, um, you know, that was a TV series that came out after the Disney Tarzan. And, you know, I remember meeting, I was with Danton Burroughs when the creative team came into the offices there in Tarzana to meet with us. And they said, we're going to try and, you know, we need a lot of material. So we're going to the books for material. We're going to sort of bring this mythos back towards Burroughs. And, and Danton and I were just as pleased as we could be. Mm-hmm. So they have a Wazirian there. Um, they have a film company that comes to town, to Africa, to try and film a Tarzan movie, similar to what happened in um, the Tarzan books. And there are a lot of neat little shout out, for example, the actor who's playing Tarzan, who's voiced by Diedrich Bader, I believe, strikes oh, a pose yeah. that is Elmo Lincoln. Mm-hmm. So if you know, you know, Elmo Lincoln's sort of publicity pose, you get it, you know, and he wears a wig like Elmo Lincoln. Hmm. Lincoln he's got a, a, a wig that's held on by a headband. So, yeah, those are two fun things. If you know the books, Lord of the Jungle and The Legend of Tarzan. Hmm. 
Okay. Now, I know there have been, uh, over the years, a lot of Tarzan imitations. I know that there were a lot of unauthorized Tarzan movies produced in India. Um, right. I was, Hollywood. I tried to get some information on those when I was researching uh, the article years ago. I didn't really have any luck. Have you seen any of those? I mean, how do those strike you? You know, that's a question that pops up periodically. I, you know, I do talks and presentations and slideshows and stuff is is there is a hunger for certainly cineasts or um, film buffs out there for more information about these Bollywood or, or you know, European Tarzans, the unauthorized ones. There's not a lot of information I could find because, you know, they were done overseas. So whatever publicity would be done would have been in another language for starters. Yeah. And a lot of them were done, you know, sort of on the sly to capitalize on Tarzan without the Burroughs people knowing it. And so I don't think they were really, they certainly didn't get the kind of press in Bollywood, for example, that the MGM Tarzans did. Mm. So I think they were just kind of made and, and put out onto the market. And there's not that much reliable information about them. And even, you know, if you start talking about, the actors in them and stuff. There's just not a lot of information. And, you know, it's interesting, Gordon Scott, you know, he went to Italy and he did sword and sandal films for many yeah. years. Yeah. There's not a lot of uh, that I can find. It may be in the Italian language, but there's not a lot of English language resources discussing that era in Gordon's life and, and what he was doing. So I think that's, you know, like I said, a sort of a double-edged sword on why we don't have more information is, is they weren't in English and they were not authorized. There's another iconic element of the Tarzan films that pretty much everyone is familiar with, and that's the Tarzan yell. Yes. Although the most well-known one is that of Johnny Weissmuller. Uh, and in fact, it was kind of tweaked for use later on in, in by other Tarzans. Uh, actually, the ironically, the very first Tarzan yell appears in a silent movie. Mm-hmm. Um, are you talking about uh, the Elmo Lincoln re-release or the Frank Merrill? Oh, I was talking about the Frank Merrill. I didn't know about the Elmo Lincoln re-release. Apparently, the Elmo, the Adventures of Tarzan, the, the serial had been re-released with some sound effects, but I have not, uh, you know, I've read that, but I haven't run across it. But, and that uh, would have been later in the, you know, probably around the time the Frank Merrill came out and had the sound put in it. Yeah, and Frank Merrill starred in two Tarzan serials. Tarzan the Mighty, which unfortunately is lost, and then the second one, which was on the cusp of the sound era, Tarzan the Tiger, which included recorded sound effect. So he gets the first Tarzan yell yes. recorded for the movies. Uh, was it Fury who described it as sounding like, you know, Tarzan's hit his thumb with a hammer or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah! 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 Yeah, it's 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 an odd sound. We talked about earlier about things people you know, they didn't get right from the books. The yell is another thing that was just just indescribable, uncanny scream. You know, if it's indescribable, you've got to describe it in the movie. MGM went with a yodel, which was very distinctive and, um, you know, a sound sweet and yodel. But it doesn't bring to mind the Tarzan yell of the books, and yet MGM was so successful that that yodel has been recycled and you know redone by many of the succeeding productions. Of course, even while Johnny Weissmuller's yell was embedding itself into the movie-going public's collective consciousness over the dozen pictures in which he played Tarzan, there were some competing screen Tarzans being seen and heard in independent productions. In 1933, there was Buster Crabbe in the serial Tarzan the Fearless. followed by Herman Bricks in the 1935 serial, The New Adventures of Tarzan. And Glenn Morris in 1938's Tarzan's Revenge. Of course, sharp-eared listeners might recognize that the yell from Tarzan's Revenge is actually just the same one as was used in Tarzan the Fearless, just a little bit shorter. So uh, those that would have been Saul Lesser's first and second Tarzan movies. Uh, I guess he just sort of recycled it. Um, one penultimate Tarzan question. Well, actually, this would be kind of the, the wrap up Tarzan question. And that's 
Sony has announced a what they're calling a reimagining of the character for at least one upcoming production. Do you have any insight into what that means or what we should expect? I don't. I don't. You know, I have friends at Sony. My understanding, and this may be wrong, is that they don't have a creative team assigned yet. They may have people who are working that other people at Sony don't know about. But as far as I know, they picked up the rights with the intention to sort of develop this from the ground up. So it wasn't a case of, I don't think, of a creative team wanting a property and the studio acquiring it. It was a studio acquiring it and then assigning a creative team. Hmm. And again, that's my understanding. You know, I don't even want to speculate. <laughs> of course, when they said that, all of the Burroughs fans said, um, well, if you want to reimagine him, reimagine him as Burroughs wrote him. <laughs> so that's never been done. Touche. Well, I guess we'll we'll just have to see. Yes. So final question. I realized that having laid out the underlying premise for this podcast being the movie going experience, I should make a habit of asking my guests what their most memorable movie going experiences have been. And in your case, for instance, it doesn't have to be related to Tarzan. So bearing that in mind, what's a special memory for you of going to the movies? I remember our parents, my brother and I, before my sister was born, would put us in our little footy pajamas and put us in the back seat of the car and take us to the drive-in for Disney movies and things of that nature. And we promptly fell asleep, which I think my parents were expecting. So I don't retain a lot of those. I uh, did a few other movies in my childhood, but the first, you know, really sort of cinematic experience, you know, which I think is what you're talking about. Where you well, sort most of memorable. Realize, it doesn't have to be the first. Right, just right. something well, really impressive. Something that sticks with you and, and you're kind of, as a child on the cusp of being a teenager, you become suddenly impressed with the awe of what this medium, the potential of this medium. Now, it's not a rerun on TV or something. It's the, the total cinematic effect. For me, it was the Dino De Laurentiis King Kong. Hmm. I was 11 years old. And, you know, after the footy pajama drive-in experience, I, I we didn't go to children to movies a lot as children. As, as You know, my parents had three children. They were outnumbered. So they didn't take us to. But I do remember my brother, my older brother, and my little sister, who would have been about six at the time, and I went to see King Kong. And the parents took us and dropped us off in my brother's care. And I remember just being sort of impressed and awed and thinking, why do I, why don't I go to the movies more often? <laughs> and, you know, King Kong uh, was for a kid who had not seen the original, who had only heard about the original, that was an impressive experience, you know? Yeah. yeah. And coincidentally, um, I'm assuming you're probably familiar with uh, Will Murray and his writings. Um, and yes. Specifically yes. the fact that he has, uh, I have not read the book, but he's got one of his novels where uh, Tarzan meets King Kong. Yeah, big fan of Will. I started reading Will. I remember we were both writing for the movie magazines at the same time, you know, in the early 90s. I think he was writing for Starlog and I was writing for Cine Fantastique. So I was familiar with his name. And then, of course, he extended the Doc Savage canon. And I was a Doc Savage reader from childhood. And I started reading Will's books. And, uh, you know, then he sort of pioneered this new model for releasing what we, I guess we would call neo pulps, pulp fiction by new authors on this print on demand format it sort of has his own operation. There's been very successful. So yeah, I've read all of his doc stuff and, and his Tarzan and Burroughs stuff. Enjoy it. You know, there are quite a few Tarzan pastiches out there. I think he's probably one of the better authorized sequel writers. Yeah, yes. Doc yes. Savage books were how I, how he first came to my attention. And then actually he, approached television chronicles uh with an interest in uh writing something for us uh but unfortunately mm -hmm. it was so late in the process we were on the verge of folding and so we didn't ever get a chance to take him up on it but i will give this little tease he is among the guests i have lined up for future episodes later this year i'll have to watch that i always enjoy what will has to say yeah i'm i'm looking forward to it doing uh doing some homework for that one too at the moment Anyway, well, I think that probably uh, has used up enough of your time, which I am very grateful for you sharing with me. Uh, once again, my guest has been Scott Tracy Griffin, the go-to expert on all things Tarzan and Edgar Rice Burroughs. Always a pleasure. And my thanks to you for listening in. If you call yourself a Tarzan fan, that would be weird if you have a perfectly usable name. But if you consider yourself to be a Tarzan fan, you absolutely need to have Tracy's books in your library. They're very handsome volumes. 
I want to remind you to please hit the subscribe or follow button wherever you're listening so that the podcasting powers that be will see what we've got going on here and give it their stamp of approval. If you can leave a rating or review, that's even better. That kind of support will help to ensure that I'm able to keep churning out episodes for as long as there's interest. Also, check out the new Movie Nights and Matinees Facebook page and website, movienightsandmatinees.com, where you can find links to more information about my guests, as well as links for ordering books and movies we've discussed and or are related to the topics we've been chatting about. Now, for purposes of the web address or URL for you techies, you have to spell out the and in movienightsandmatinees.com instead of using the ampersand the way is done in the logo and official podcast title. Purchases made through the links on the website will help support the podcast. Also, if you're really, really enjoying the podcast, click on the memorabilia link on the website and check out the line of movie nights and matinees merchandise that will help you spread the word. And now, as the sun sets on Tarzan's misty jungle, we wave a fond farewell and look to episode three. The number three holds special significance in that the topic will be 3D movies, and it will be a three-way conversation with guests Bob Fermanek, founder of the 3D Film Archive, and Greg Kintz, the Archive's technical director, two gentlemen whose work has allowed us to see movies from the golden age of 3D as they were meant to be seen in our homes. So join me for episode three, when my guests and I will explore such profound cinematic questions as... What do you want? What are you doing? Let me see you as you really are. 